in Vienna with Professor Gerhard Budin. Budin, we pronounce it. Budin, yes. Where does the name come from? Um, well, that's a difficult question. It seems to come from Sweden, but okay. uh, then it moved uh, in the 17th century to uh, Czech um, area, and uh, so the, the, the origin of our family is from Czech. Okay, family. but yeah. you're Austrian? Yes, huh? yes, okay. fourth generation Austrian. All right, okay. Viennese. And what's your job, Professor? Uh, well, I'm a full professor of uh, here at the Center for Translation Studies, and the field is uh, translation technologies and terminology studies. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've been on this post for 10 years now, uh, but I've been teaching at the University of Vienna for 25 years now. Oh, so you, you rose up through the ranks? Uh, here, no, or no, actually how not. That, uh, how did that work? So uh, my career was quite. Uh, uh, winded, yes. so to say, and international. So I, I worked in Paris, I worked in different places, and uh, also worked at the uh, International Center for Terminology, InfoTerm. Okay. That, at that time, okay, so you've been in and out of, yes, of yes. academic life. And uh, oh. when I did my habilitation in the 90s, I was okay. an external teacher. Habilitation is the second doctorate. That's yes. Big doctorate, yes. Right? yes. Okay. So you were saying you were where in, uh, in the nineties? Uh, you, you did that. Yes, uh, in the nineties, uh, and um, I actually worked in the fields of philosophy of science. Yeah? So, but I, I was teaching um, terminology studies, knowledge engineering, but also at the uh, then Institute for Translation and Interpreting. I started uh, teaching terminology in the where early nineties. Here. It was uh, the department at that time was part of the main uh, building. Uh, okay. It was a very tiny institute okay. at that time. Okay. Um, and uh, because now translation and interpreting, translation, Wissenschaft, you have a huge building. Yes, here, uh, and here it's here. a center. It's a faculty by its own. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the nineteen centers faculties of the University of Vienna since uh, since two thousand four. Do you know how many students are here at the faculty? Uh, about 2,500. Okay, it's huge. Yeah, it's it huge. Really is. Okay. And we, we have about 14 languages, no? including German as a pivot language, mm -hmm. and then also including Chinese, Japanese, right. Russian, Portuguese, Romanian, Hungarian. And, uh, so, so your background is, in, is not in translation as such. It's no. in related Yeah, things. because at that time, uh, I did my master um, in the mid '80s mm. and in translation, but at that time the, the, this uh, study program was very practical, without mm -hmm. any research. There was no professorship, nobody. No? Mm. So we did our diploma thesis uh, at other departments, and I did it uh, with uh, Professor Dressler at the linguistics department. Mm -hmm. And this is where I also did then later my PhD in linguistics. So I, I completed also a linguistics uh, study, uh, including the doctorate in linguistics. So you're coming at translation from a linguistics terminology background. Yes, um, and terminology actually from a, let's say, um, cross-disciplinary perspective, philosophy of science and linguistics. No? Okay, so I don't have to ask what you were doing in your mid twenties. Yeah, you were doing the master's thesis. I yeah, suppose, I finished the master in eighty five. That uh, I was okay. aged uh, twenty five at that time. Okay. And then I did a, a world tr a trip for okay. half a year. Good, good. That's a good thing to do. <laughs> and then I lived for half a year. I lived in Spain. I worked as a translator in Barcelona. Oh, really? Yeah. At what time is it? In eighty five. I would have been there working as a translator in right. '85. Okay, we're yes. probably competing. Yeah. So I worked Spanish, uh, German. Right? I, I okay. did technical translation yeah, sure. there, okay. and um, I had some a lot of free time as well. And I, I started uh, studying at the University of Barcelona, mm -hmm. Universitat Central Linguistics, no? mm -hmm. and uh, half of the classes were taught in in Spanish and the other one in Catalan. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Practiced my Catalan. Catalan. Well. That's a good thing to do too. Okay. Yeah, and then afterwards, <clears throat> I, I started the uh, linguistics uh, doctorate uh, 
I think it was Tirana was was okay. a translator. Did you ever intend to stay or think about staying in the translation profession? Originally, it was my plan to become a technical translator. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. was my original plan. But uh, it somehow happened that I moved into research, and and so, but uh, during the dissertation uh, study, the doctoral study, I started to work at InfoTerm, at the mm -hmm. Center for Terminology, as a freelancer. So I earned some some mm -hmm. money for for myself, and uh, and so I got into this. Uh, activities, uh, also into projects, and uh, the director, Christian Galinsky, then took me, uh, when I was still quite young, uh, to China and to different places oh, really? in the world. Doing terminology. Yeah, then. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, starting to teach, uh, starting to do research um, in an extra university center, mm -hmm. but very international. And uh, since I always enjoyed traveling already as a student, so this was the right thing for me. Right? Okay. I, I always wonder if there's a particular personality that is attracted to terminology. I mean, translation is very complex and indeterminate. Terminology seems to be the opposite to that. Is there something in that or, or not? Uh, well, it seems. Uh, but okay. uh, when you look closer at it, then uh, this indeterminacy is also there. Mm -hmm. It's always there. But it's the enemy. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. But uh, when you have a still closer look, uh, being a researcher, then you really uh, reflect about uh, these things in a critical way. And then, because my doctoral dissertation topic was terminology work in the social sciences, and there mm -hmm. it turns out very uh, clearly that it's impossible to have terms that have only one meaning mm -hmm. and that have terms that are equivalent in all those languages. Mm -hmm. It simply doesn't work. No? Do you find there's a lot of politics, particularly in the social science, in uh, the use of one term mm -hmm. or another? Or, or is, is that um, too, too much of a simplification? Yeah, there are several reasons for this indeterminacy and, and complexity of terminology in the social sciences mm -hmm. and humanities. One reason is the um, uh, the that you have multiple theories, and, and each theory has certain concepts that are part of this uh, theory, and that are theory-laden, and, and so uh, each uh, theory has its own terminology, and when it's translated, uh, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, like Freud's uh, uh, books, when they were translated into other languages, mm -hmm. they had to create this terminology in other languages. Yes. Right? Yes. So it was a creative act of terminology design. And there's lots of debate now about how how, how Freud was translated and yes, yes. made into something more clinical. Yeah, yeah. And, and so uh, nowadays, when uh, looking at terminology studies nowadays, um, many of these myths uh, have been removed already no? or uncovered because it's clear that... Uh, terms vary through language usage no? uh, and uh, that terms differ uh, across cultures and, and also be, be, uh, across dis disciplines. No? Mm. So it's a very complex field and a, a very dynamic field. Okay. Yeah? You have led an incredible number of research projects uh, from here in Vienna. I mean, it's 40 or something Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about those research projects or what topics they're in or what, what has been most sustainable in, in that work? Yeah. Well, um, there are several uh, clusters of topics mm -hmm. uh, where we did uh, these projects. One cluster is, let's say, terminology in specific domains. No? So, mm -hmm. for instance, one of these projects that is would say quite sustainable is uh, the terminology of uh, risk communication and risk management. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an um, open, openly accessible terminology database uh, running, uh, hosted uh, here at, at the university, and it's in eight languages and uh, was an international project and mm -hmm. also European funding and national funding, so it was quite uh, useful um, to serve also the communication needs of, of different domain mm -hmm. uh, communities to serve the needs of, of uh, translators. Uh, so 
That's good. Uh, so one, this this is one type of project. Um, mm -hmm. For years, we also did uh, terminology in the field of environmental law, environmental mm -hmm. management, environmental protection, national level, uh, European level, working towards the European thesaurus for environmental good. protection, things like this. The second do, do you as a terminologist just decide which is the best term to use? Or do you present the terms that are out there? So the principle is to work together with domain experts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have this, uh, let's say, classical division of descriptive and prescriptive terminology right. work. So uh, we, as, as language experts, we rather do the descriptive part. Mm -hmm. And then we present the dossiers uh, to the experts, and then they decide. No? OK. So okay. that's the, the usual way to okay. do things. Uh, also in Canada or in other places, uh, this is the way to, to do it. And um, uh, domain experts then also get interested uh, in this and also work as terminologists. Mm -hmm. and so it's not just the language people who do this. No? Okay. Uh, okay. And, and in quite a number of domains in uh, natural sciences, there are a lot of domain experts who do this terminology work also in a, t a prescriptive way. That means they create standards in order to facilitate their own communication. You are recently head of a, a TransCert project, a mm -hmm. project for the certification of translators. Can you talk about that a, a little bit? Yes. Uh, so that belongs to another cluster of projects that we have been doing, more in the field of, of uh, translation, in, the, in this case uh, for the translation profession. Um, it's a hotly debated topic, no? so there are two camps, uh, so mm -hmm. to say, at least in some parts of, of, of the different communities that we have been addressing. So there are actually three pillars, uh, three communities that uh, are part of this. One community is the translation companies no? mm -hmm. who search for reliable, uh, well-trained um, translators to be hired uh, in their business. Uh, so that's one group. The second group are the uh, professional organizations, mm -hmm. national, European, international. Um, and the third group is the academic institutions uh, offering translation mm -hmm. programs. No? And so the transfer project um, was um, uh, consisted of, of uh, representatives of, of these uh, three communities. Mm -hmm. no? Uh, so we developed uh, uh, a uh, quite a detailed uh, topology of uh, resources, of test uh, questions, of uh, um, certification procedures, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the plan is to continue this uh, project uh, in an um, up updated uh, manner, uh, and uh, of course to address the, the shortcomings or the criticisms that have, have been voiced by uh, some part of the community. Uh, apparently some translators uh, perceive this as a, as a threat to their own business, but it's not. How right? so? How I don't could it know. be a threat? I don't know. Okay. Uh, so we try to take, or we do take all these concerns very seriously, mm -hmm. and uh, we are actually very glad about uh, the, the critical discussions and the debates so that we can um, uh, adapt and, and improve and further develop uh, the whole okay. approach uh, in order to address the needs because mm. we are convinced that the profession of translation needs professionalization mm -hmm. and standards is one thing um, as we can see in all uh, spheres of industry and, and, and the economy standards always uh, helped uh, to professionalize a certain domain or a certain profession. Mm. And there are a lot of certification uh, uh, procedures for many different professions nowadays. And so we thought, well, why not also for translators? And uh, actually, a num uh, many translation companies demanded this. And they said, well, if you don't do this, then we do it just ours by sure. ourselves. Yeah. Right? What are we talking about? I mean, would you agree that in Europe we need an exam-based certification process, independent from the training processes? 
Yes, absolutely. It must then be why independent. Do, why don't we just do that? Now, yeah. Well, so, <laughs> I mean, I, I get frustrated with European projects like yes. this that are very careful, bit by bit, get the people yeah. together. Surely it's just set it up and do yeah. it. So yeah. actually, uh, the, the project, the official uh, project uh, with the European Union uh, funding uh, just finished, but now it's the time to get started, mm -hmm. yes. So uh, more or less everything is prepared by now, so we need to, to do some more things to set up uh, the, the procedures and to, st to start going. Yeah. Okay, uh, but, good. But <laughs> do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but um, of course we want to have all major uh, communities on board. Yeah? So it's mm -hmm. also a political process um, and uh, uh, but uh, I'm confident that during this year of 2015, uh, it will uh, turn out to work. You know? um, Good. Okay. There's a um, debate recently about um, the European Commission's policy on translation language or translation technology research and complaints that it's being sidelined, that we are capitulating to non-European sources of technology, etc. Um, is that is that a, a valid, in that debate, where would you position yourself? Mm -hmm. People are, are not happy about research that has been done in Europe on translation technology. Yeah. Um, I think that um, a lot of uh, excellent research has been done in the past decades, um, but uh, a lot of this research was not sustainable enough so mm. many projects uh, as soon as the project finished then things uh, the results more or less disappeared and new projects started uh, so uh, we need a different approach uh, that is more sustainable and also i observed that uh, a lot of these research communities uh, doing these projects uh, worked in splendid isolation mm -hmm. uh, not in the, um, not uh, together with domain communities. No? Um, so I th I, I'm afraid that uh, uh, this language technology research, or part of that, was too abstract, uh, too much mm -hmm. uh, just serving its own uh, research objectives, but not enough uh, serving the, uh, the, the needs and requirements of, of the community, of, of Europe, of multilingual Europe. And also um, quite a number of policy projects uh, we also participated uh, and also uh, research infrastructure projects that we are also participating I think still have the, the challenge to to be more embedded in um, broader uh, perspectives and broader community uh, goals and, and uh, activities so the Connecting Europe facility, the CEF, uh, I think is a good means to do that. And also Horizon 2020, the work program, where language technology research is there, but it's more contextualized mm -hmm. in different uh, areas like uh, big data or data analytics, right. things like this. Yeah. So I think this is good. So it should not be isolated. So it's good for us not to be independent. It's yeah. good for us to be with the other research communities. Yes. What about um, cooperation with between the university system and industry? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that the things that have helped the translation profession, uh, that is translation memory systems and statistical machine translation, have been developed in industry, not really in, in the academy. Um, do, should we be doing more in those terms in Europe to work with private companies? I think the work with private companies um, has been successful, but still, as I mentioned before, uh, some of these projects were not sustainable. So uh, very good prototypes uh, emerged, but then as soon as funding stopped, mm -hmm. uh, then the project was, was shelved. No? So uh, it needs more long-term uh, projects. Uh, in order to really make sure that uh, the prototypes uh, developed really become uh, uh, products no? that are then used by industry. No? Um, of course, there's also a problem uh, because uh, universities are more interested in open source, uh, open data, mm -hmm. 
And while industry still, or at least parts of industry, are still interested in commercial systems, commercial data. They make money, of course. They are. Okay. But the problem is that uh, the let's say the, the research community or many other user communities uh, in, in society are not willing to pay uh, high prices for data right? uh, because there yeah. are a lot of data in, in the, uh, accessible on the web like dictionaries, mm -hmm, and, uh, sure. lingui or whatever um, and so the readiness to pay for uh, dictionaries for databases but also for translation programs for technology management systems whatever it is the readiness to pay for that is is dwindling yes. even more yes. you know? uh, so I'm not sure where this uh, uh, this process is developing uh, to you know? we have the same also in academic publishing you know? there has been criticism yeah. about uh, commercial publishers and, uh, s and some hope in open access journals and things like this right. you know? so it's it's not easy you know? okay. F final question if you were a doctoral student now or in, uh, what what areas do you think you should be doing research in what are the areas that are most in need of, of research at the moment they are neat um, um, I think uh, researchers should do what what fascinates them most okay. no? yeah. and um, of course, uh, there are many areas where there is a need. No? Um, uh, so, for instance, uh, in translation studies, uh, things uh, happening in migration processes mm -hmm. in Europe, no? asylum seekers mm -hmm. supporting them, uh, things like this is. is uh, I think uh, there's a lot of, of research needed that also then is turned into best practices. Good. Yes. No? Uh, but uh, of course. Um, what, what fascinates me is still the, let's say, big data, data analytics, mm -hmm. and things like this. No? Uh, so I would, I would go into this direction if I were young now. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> but, but at the same time, uh, there's always, uh, let's say, an application scenario. So it should not be abstract. And there's always this debate about fundamental research versus applied research. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I don't agree to that, uh, that we have to decide or that both is needed, because I think that um, any kind of research uh, has both sides, uh, at least potentially, in, inside. So you need to develop this. No? So when, when we do a, a domain-specific terminology project, you always have the fundamental research questions. Okay. What is a concept? What is, what is an object? And things okay. like this. It's very ph philosophical. Uh, at the same time, it's very practical, no? and the thing in translation studies, it's the same. No? Uh, that you have fundamental philosophical problems of language and, and cultural diversity and whatever, and at the same time, you you need to do a practical translation uh, job. No?